All right, hello everyone, good morning. Um, it's nine o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, today we are going to be talking about uh, the reports, uh, the utilities menu, and then some miscellaneous items. Um, our, we are shooting to take a break around 10.15, so um, we'll keep an eye on that. Um, just have a little break up in the middle there. And then, um, yeah, so hopefully we'll wrap up around noon. The first thing that um, I wanna do here is actually go to the wiki. Um, for the reports, we're gonna look at the different places, uh, the different types of reports, the different um, <clears throat> ways to run them, talk about customizing reports. Um, but one of the things when you're getting into USAS that I found really helpful is uh, this crosswalk that we've created. So I'm in the USSR documentation. If I open up um, the report section and go to the report manager, this template report section, it lists out all of the different template reports that are available in USAS. And if you come to this section, the first thing that's in here, um, it has this grid with a column for the classic report comparison. Uh, this can be really handy when you're first in there. You know, if, if you have a district looking for a bud work, you can see, all right, this is my most comparable report to that classic version. Just gonna go back to, so um, the other thing that I found myself doing in here before is uh, now I'm just on the USSR documentation page and I already had it typed in here, but um, if you have maybe a classic report and you don't see it on that list or you want a kind of quick way to search for it, um, it's worth a go to type the report in here, do a quick search, and then that'll help you find the, com um, the comparative report in redesign. So for this one, I put in uh, the AMD cert, so like an amended certificate report, um, and I can see kind of from my pop-ups here that um, certification appropriation reports if i click on here um, it'll give me a page that gives me more information um, i can also see from this page that it's on the periodic menu so we'll take a look at those in the software but um, as you get going if there's something specific that you are looking for from classic that's a pretty handy way to go um, search and see if there is a comparable uh, a specific comparable report in redesign All right, so once we're in here, um, I wanna talk about, I kind of have it broken down into three different kinds of reports. Um, all of these reports that we see on the home page and the reports that can be found in the report manager are template reports. So those reports we can, um, we have the option to modify and we'll look at an example of kind of customizing um, that report. When we get to generating the report, all the template reports have a similar setup as far as the generation window that you get, um, and they have similar options when it comes to formatting um, and that sort of thing. So those are the template reports. The next place that we have reports or the next type of report are our canned reports, and that includes the reports that we see in this drop down here. And then the other category that I have are the periodic reports. So this is where um, certification report, so that amended certificate report is in here. Um, appropriation resolution, 1099 extract, kind of the same idea as the canned reports. Um, those two categories, they are a bit more complex. So they don't fall, they're, they're not the same in the, as the template reports in the fact of you can't like modify or customize them um, in the same way um, because maybe they have a certain layout or they grab information from different places. Um, or if it's something that should be standard, like the 1099 extract, that's a report you're always gonna wanna have the output in the same format. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and go into one of these 
uh, canned reports here. So I just have the account status report that I want to look at. When you pull one of these up, there's generally, um, well, there it would be a set of um, options that you can use to run the report. And each one of these is different. So this is just one example. Um, but what you would be able to do is enter any filters here. It has a start and end date range. And then all of the canned reports were recently updated to include this show report option and a format option. These are just the defaults. Um, I'm going to go ahead and run this report so we can see what this one looks like. Um, but while that's loading, the thing to mention here is um, the format. It defaults to PDF. Let me see if we can look at this real quick. We have some options if we took it to um, Excel or like a web page, um, but this Excel is still going to be formatted similar to look like the PDF. Um, the spreadsheet options like Excel data and uh, CSV options are not available for those reports just yet because they are um, complex, so they're not just uh, straight data like you could have in a spreadsheet normally. Um, so that's something that we're working towards in the future. Um, so for now, um, that does have a more limited set of options on your canned reports. Um, but here my report completed. So I can see I have the report options page. So that show report options, it um, gave me this, uh, this cover page, I guess, um, title page. And then my report shows um, it's filtered down to just that fund that I entered in. And this one shows me the different um, account transactions here. Um, also in the documentation, I know we looked at the template reports, but there is a page that gives um, more detail on each one of these canned reports um, as well. So if there's something specific you're looking for um, or need additional information about these other options for the canned reports, um, I would take a look there. All right, I'm going to head back to the home page because I think um, we're just going to roll right into the template report since there's kind of a lot to unpack there. Um, I'm going to open a budget summary. So this little icon right here is for is to generate. That's um, your generate button, I guess. And when you open up the report, um, let me just make sure my options are reset. We'll talk about this save and recall in a minute. Um, but your basic, um, the basic page you get when you when you open up to generate is going to look like this for all the template reports. Your report options tab. This is kind of um, your basic format and um, your format information. So here we can choose PDF. I do have the option um, for these type of reports to choose a CSV or Excel data is what's going to actually get you a spreadsheet in Excel. And then there's an Excel field names as well. Which the Excel field names, um, on the USAF side, we'll, we'll talk about mass load when we get to the utilities, but um, it's basically only the um, account information that you would load right now, but I mean, we are looking at a budget summary. So if, they're, um, if you're trying to pull information at some point to be able to mass load it back in, the Excel field name gives you the headings that you would need for that. The page size, so this determines, you know, is it a normal letter size? Is it legal? Um, you have some different options here. Orientation will determine if it's portrait or landscape. You can change that on any of these template reports. The name is going to be the title that shows on the top of the report. So um, let's we usually stick with our 006 fund in our examples here. So I'm going to make this a budget summary report um, for cafeteria.
The summary report, um, once we get to the last page, we'll talk about the control break. But um, basically, if you check this, it will give you um, a shorter report that only um, summarizes to like the totals that you would see on a regular report. And then show report options, that's the same thing as we saw with um, our canned report, is that's going to give us the cover page showing the options that we chose when we ran the report. To navigate through these um, different tabs, I can just click right on the tab header. I do have some arrows down here that will help me switch pages. So you have a couple options that do the same thing. The second tab for query options is more about, um, it's, it's basically filtering the information. So, you know, this report is going to pull all of my budget accounts, but if I want to narrow down which budget accounts it picks, uh, then I can use these different parameters to, um, to filter that down. So I can say, you know, I'm just going to pick this fund. Maybe I only want active accounts. These uh, do vary depending on which report you're looking at. So some of these template reports have a full page of options like this. Uh, some may only have a couple. Um, those are written into each report, um, each report template. The total as of period, I want to talk about this one real quick. Um, when I run this, this report, um, as an account-based report, has year-to-date and month-to-date totals on it. On Tuesday, I talked about how you can always see your, um, your posting period up at the top here. So I can see I'm in March of 2020. If I leave that blank and run this report, all my month-to-date totals will be for March of 2020, and my fiscal-to-date totals will be up to March of 2020. What this total as of period allows me to do is type in, <clears throat> excuse me, type in a date um, for a previous period, and then that will have my totals as of that prior period. So say I only wanted to see um, totals from, let's do January. Um, the date that I type in, it does, you can see my formats that pop up here. Um, if I enter any date within the month that I want the totals as of, so I can put in 1-1-2020, my totals would still be through the end of January. So I know that can be a little bit confusing. If you want to enter 1-31-2020, um, then you could do it that way. If that, um, or 1-30, I don't know, off the top of my head. <laughs> Hope not being, uh, saying that wrong there. Um, but either way, if you were to enter any date within that month, it will be it will still give you the totals as of the end of the month. So I'm just going to leave it at one one for now. Filter name, we're going to look at an example of making a filter and using it on one of these reports. So we'll get there. And then um, exclude accounts with zero amount. Um, so this is a true false. This one, uh, the filters existed for a little bit to uh, add to custom reports, but we just added it to all of these account reports as a standard option. Um, what this does is um, it looks at the account and if all qualifying fields are zero, if there was basically kind of no activity, then it will filter out, uh, well, it'll filter out any of those lines, any of those accounts that are all zero, if you set this to true. If you leave it blank, you get all of the accounts, regardless of whether they have um, figures in them or not. And then false, you would get a report of only the accounts that have all zero amounts matching. Our last page here is the sort options page. So um, this one's really interesting. Um, this is kind of 
when we did the dynamic sort updates, you know, this was the big um, new one that we added here. And what you're seeing is uh, a list of sortable properties, so different items that you can use to sort or um, in some cases subtotal the report if there are um, if there are calculations if there are totals like this report has. And these sortable properties come from properties that are showing on the report. So I on this report I'm going to see my expended amounts, my encumbrance amounts. Um, or in some cases, additional um, figure or additional fields properties have been added. So you can use those to sort too. So we can see here that um, our different account code pieces are available to add as a sort. Um, now, whatever is set as part of the default account is going to show as our selected properties um, when we first open this. And then we have an option to um, to sort of customize that if we want. What we're seeing here right now, so this first uh, property, if I hover, I can see that that's actually the cash account code. So the first thing that this report is going to look at when it decides what order to show me the accounts in is going to be the cash code, the cash count. Um, the second thing is the full account code, which is the expenditure account. So just as far as what order to show me information in, that's what it's going to use. Um, then I have the checkbox for ascending, or if I uncheck it, it's descending. So that's basically your um, low to high, A to Z, um, or if it's unchecked, then it's the reverse. The control break is where uh, is basically what um, it's basically what determines what it's going to total on. So in this case, I have a control break on my cash account, and that means every time there's a new cash account, I'm going to get a new heading. And then for the previous, you know, for each cash account category, I'm also getting a total of all of the accounts within that on any figures that I've set to to have a total. So in this case, it's going to be my appropriated, my encumbrance amounts, my expendable. Um, the last option here is the page break. So what the page break would do is actually start a new page. So if I checked it on this one, then every time I have a new cash account, it's going to start a whole new page. If I wanted to customize this default, um, all I need to do is come over here and then click and drag what I want to bring over. Um, so for this example, I have the cash account, but say I want a more specific um, group of uh, subtotals in there. So if I um, pick object one digit level, that'll give me totals by like my 100 objects, my 200 objects. And I'm just going to click and drag, and I have this blue line where I can see where that's going. I do want to place it where I want it in the list, because once it's over here, you can't move them around, but um, you can move them uh, back if you need to place it in a different spot. So if I want it in the middle here, I have the blue line, let it go, and then it'll insert that into my list. Um, so now it's the second sort order, and if I do a control break, that'll allow it to um, do a subtotal. So um, we'll run this and take a look at what it looks like. All right, so I, I kept my um, show report options checked. So that's why I'm seeing this page here. My as of period, um, it includes that on there so I can see that I, um, you know, didn't have it kind of for the current period. And then when I um, come down here, I have the full account code. Uh, so that's my cash account. That was my first control break. And then I have the second header is this um, object one digit level. So my 100. And then this is where I get a subtotal. So um, specifically this 
and then these totals um, and having it in that order is what I changed by um, just dragging and dropping that uh, property into the sort properties. And then at the bottom here, I get my grand total of everything. Um, just gonna open this one back up so we can look. Now, um, I also said we'd look at the save and recall option. So when I open this back up, this changes to most recent. And this is kind of why I wanted to reset it before because per user, it will always save my most recent options in here so that the next time I come in, if I just, if there's a certain way I always run a report, it's gonna save that. So as I go through and look at these different options, it saved those same options that I used um, instead of clearing them out and then me having to do them again. Um, if you do want to easily clear them out, you can go click that default and that'll clear everything. If you want to save those so you don't have to, you know, maybe you do want to run this report for something else, but you might want to run this one again later, you can save these options um, by making your own save and recall. So I would just click on the empty line. Type in whatever name I want. And then when I tab off of this, the save icon pops up. And I can save that. And then now that's going to be in my list. And um, if I say I went to the default, so now I can see all of this cleared out. This is back to normal. Um, but next time I come in here, I know I want to run um, those options that I had for the cafeteria fund. All I have, to, all I do is just choose it from the list and it populates that back. One trick if you're in here, um, kind of switching these around like we're doing right now, um, go back to the default before picking a different filter. If you try and switch, or not necessarily filter, a different save and recall, um, you know, the default actually clears everything out. But if you start switching between different save and recalls, like if I pick this one and then I pick this one, sometimes um, not all the boxes clear out. So that's something we're aware of and we're looking at. Um, but your way to avoid that is to just go back to the default before you're trying to pick a new one. Um, while we're talking about this, when you have a save and recall, um, you also see this link icon that pops up here. Uh, if you uh, choose your save and recall, click this icon, it does uh, give you a link that you can uh, bookmark or there are cases where you can use this to pull data into Excel. Um, you can send this link to another user. Um, so there are a lot of options there. Um, I'm not going to go per too much farther into that today. We had a reports training, I believe in September. Let me check my notes. Yeah, September of 2019, um, where we actually went through um, a more detailed example of this. So if that is something that you're interested in, check out the recording for that September reports training that is out. Um, on the archive training page. Oh, the other thing, let's look at, um, now that we have some more control breaks on this report, let's run a summary report real quick. I just wanna show you what um, an example of that would look like. Uh, so similar thing here, we have our options page, but once we come down here, now my report only shows what, um, so this was my first control break was the um, cash account. 
And then now it's showing me the totals for each of those um, object levels. When you're using that summary version, um, you know, if you have a report that doesn't have any control breaks, then it's not going to work with the summary version. So keep that in mind um, if you're ever trying to run that and you're running into um, any inconsistencies there. Um, the other thing is the uh, control breaks don't show if you're taking this into Excel data format. So the summary version also doesn't work in Excel data format. Um, so just if those are things that uh, you are running into, if you're trying to use the summary report, um, generally, if you're trying to take something to Excel data, uh, there's a different report or a different way to pull it um, instead of using the summary version. So if that's ever something that um, you're running into, let us know. We can help you figure out where to pull it from instead. Okay, so um, just making sure I hit everything I wanted to there um, before we switch over to um, the next level here, which is actually going into the report manager. So once we're in here, our reports that we have in the grid, these are the same um, list of reports that we could see on our home page. So we have all the template reports. Um, but we do have additional um, ways to kind of search for these, additional information in here. Um, I have the report name, but now for all of these SSDT template reports, we have a description. Also, I have the ability to search for um, a certain report. So I'm going to go ahead and, um, oops, I need to use my correct wildcards, um, but if I put, you know, um, part of my report title in here and then put it with the um, wildcards at the front and back, then I'll get a list of all the reports that uh, match, that, that have that word in it. We also have some more icons over to the left here. So I have the generate icon, just like I had on the home page. This view icon is actually what will open my full report definition. That's what I'm going to use if I want to customize a report. Um, we'll get in there in a minute. Um, so I'm not going to click that one just yet. Uh, this next one for edit is uh, to edit the name. Uh, description and tags. Now, um, this is more relevant for your custom reports. So, on the SSDT report, I can give this a tag. Um, the tags can be added as a column to your grid, um, or actually, they might be on there after the description. But this is where you could tag the report something like monthly or um, year end or something like that. Um, and basically, that's just used um, optionally by districts if they want to be able to query that easily in their grid. Let me get rid of my filter here real quick. I want to show you. Um, so say this is like uh, one of my custom reports. I could click this, and I have a couple more options to change my report name or my description. The next one here is um, the option to delete a report. Now, I only have this option for um, reports in here that are custom ones. Obviously, you can't delete the SSDT uh, standard reports. Um, but as an admin, I could, I actually have somebody else's that I could remove here. A standard user would pretty much only have that option for reports that they've created. Well, and they would only see reports that they've created if for a standard user.
the next icon on here, um, this little piece of paper, is for downloading the report definition. Um, if you are creating custom reports and you want to share it with, uh, a, you know, if a district wants to share it to another district, um, if or your level you're sharing with another ITC, um, something like that, you would be able to download this report definition. You'd just click this icon. It would download to your computer into um, a JSON file, and then you could send that to someone else, and they could use this import option to um, pull that report into their instance. And then um, this next one is share report definition with roles. So um, as the admin user, I can see all the reports that are in there. But if I have um, a district user say, you know, the treasurer is writing their own report and they want to share that with anybody that has um, USAS read-only access or something, um, they could click on this and then it would give them the option to say, okay, anybody that has read-only can also see this report. And then um, once they save that up, then when those other users log in, they would be able to access and run that report um, from their home page or from their report manager. And then the last one on this um, whole icon list is favorite. So um, on that main page, we were looking at everything, but we do have the option to click a couple of these as our favorite reports. And clicking a lot of things, so it's giving me trouble. There we go. Um, so I can click a couple of these and favorite them, and then um, when I switch back over to my home page, I have just this limited list of my favorites. And if I wanted to see everything, I still could expand that. Um, but that just kind of helps if, you know, there are reports that um, someone's using all the time. It can be kind of overwhelming if they have a high level of access. They might have a lot of reports in there normally. All right, so um, the next thing we're going to do, we're actually going to click into that view and look at uh, modifying uh, one of these report definitions. And let's pull up our cache, cache summary again. I'm going to pick the cache summary because I feel like uh, this one is uh, pretty straightforward. And um, we have, you know, a good amount of fields. We have some filters on this. So once I'm in here, um, this is the same layout as my custom report creator. So I can actually see custom report creator in the top. Um, we'll hop into that custom report creator, but it's going to look the same. It's just not going to have all of this data in it yet. Um, so I kind of like to talk about the, the things that you'd see in there or that you'd have to select when we have this view, because it's a little bit nicer when you can actually see something um, to start. So the first thing here that um, controls this page is this select object. Now this is a cache summary. It's pulling information from my cache account. So the object that I have is the cache count. This object controls what properties that I have available um, in my menu here to select and use. And if I open this up, I can see that I have a whole lot of options. So if I was creating a report from scratch, you know, I could come in here and, you know, if I'm wanting um, a report that includes things from the disbursement page, I could choose that. Um, you know, pending transactions, I have my different um, accounts in here, uh, different transactions. So depending on what kind of report I want, I would um, figure out which object to choose. Um, and then that would allow me to select different items, different properties from those pages to pull onto my report. These um, are kind of like the tables that you would have in Safari. 
So in classic, you'd go into Safari, you'd choose one of those categories and then expand the drop down. Um, that I'm basically choosing which table here and then that what's going to populate in my properties um, box below is going to be what would have been in the drop down. Obviously, those aren't one for one. I think there's more in redesign, um, but it's the same idea. And uh, it's also kind of nice when you're modifying the template report, if you can find a template report to start from, um, if there's some kind of custom report that you want, because you know the object, like in this one, will already be selected. Uh, if you're going completely from scratch, sometimes it takes a bit to figure out, you know, which one of these properties has what you need. And if I am in, in a template report that already exists like this, um, I'm purposely not clicking on any of these other ones here because it'll wipe out everything that I have here. So we're just going to close off of that um, to make sure that I still have where I started. Now, um, I have the, so the properties are what I have available to pull into the report. Um, and then I have my three different tabs in the middle here that control, um, well, that show me different pieces as far as building this report. Um, so the first one is select properties. And what's included, what you wanna put on this select properties grid are basically the columns that you want to show on the report. Or um, now that we have the sort options with the dynamic um, sort, you could also maybe add things that you might want to be able to sort on, but you maybe don't want it to show on the report and um, you can suppress them so they don't show. So we'll, we'll look at the option to do that in a minute here. But for the most part, it's going to be, I like to think of this page anyways, as like, here's what I want to see on my report. Now, um, here's all, our, all of our standard things. If there um, maybe is something when we're modifying one of these that we don't want on here, we can um, just click the remove icon. So that's pretty easy to update as far um, as taking things off. Um, I can click and drag and move things around once I have the properties over here. And if I wanna add something new, I would basically find it on my list and uh, let me see what I have for my example here. Um, so my cache summary is, this is like my fin sum in classic. So what I'm gonna do for this example is, you know, we have all of our figures on here, um, but say that we want to uh, customize this so that it only shows um, accounts that had um, a month to date amount received. That'd be this column here. So we have that on there. Um, I think the properties, I don't know. I really need to add anything, but let's add something just, just because. Um, let's do our fiscal to date receivable. So um, if I want to add this field here, I can just click and drag. I can put it um, anywhere within here if I wanted. Um, and then with this one, I do have the option to kind of move these around within the grid. So they're a little bit different than those sort properties. And let's take one, I'm gonna take another one of those off just, uh, just for good measure. When I get this report, I don't want it to be too overcrowded. Okay. All right, so now let's talk about um, the different options that we have uh, for each property once we get the properties that we want on this grid. The first one is sort priority. Similar to what we saw um, with ordering those different properties on, um, on our pop-up when we, when we generated the report, uh, this is gonna actually dictate what the default order is. So. Uh, my full account code here is my cash account. So right now, that's going to be my first sort priority. I could, you know, pick something to have 
the second um like the second sort priority so if you know it would be um kind of what we saw in that budget summary report where it was cash account and then full account code uh this one's a little bit more straightforward since we're just looking at cash account so i think we'll leave that the same um but if you had a report where you needed to do something like that you would just be able to select um you know your sequence of numbers as far as um which other fields you might want to um, be sorted on We can pick um, ascending or descending. And then if I did want to make this a control break, I could um, check my control break box there. This one's pretty straightforward, so I'm actually going to leave that off um, for the sake of this report that we're creating. Um, the next thing here is the function. So. Um, where we were looking at that budget summary and, you know, I kind of said this will give you a total or a subtotal if it's set up to have a total. This is what I'm talking about. Um, when we were looking at our report before, these defaults, you know, a lot of these columns are already set up so that when it gets to a control break or it gets to the end of the report, it's going to, you know, give you a total at the bottom or it's going to sum it. It's going to add everything in that column together. Um, you have some different options if you wanted to have a uh, minimum maximum or average you could choose that instead um, but we do need to pay attention to this because our new field right here we added this fiscal to date receivable so let's make sure that that has a sum so that we get a total for that as well the last uh column other than our remove which we already talked about are these three little dots and these are the extended properties we have um we have these uh some notes about these in the documentation so um if you are going to be using these that may be a good reference when you um, are taking a look at it but uh, just to kind of brief over um, what these are give you an idea um, the display name is just what we're seeing here. You can't change that. Suppressed. So if I check this box, um, it'll leave it on my properties, but um, or and it'll still include it in the sort priority, but it won't actually show it on my report. Uh, the main way that I've used that is, you know, if you are doing a control break and you don't want it it's a heading and then you don't want it to also be its own column you could suppress it um, or if you're adding something that you want to be able to be used in that um, sort properties on the generate uh, window but you don't want to actually see it in a column on your report then you could suppress it sort priority and sort order we already talked about those um, this is the same um, setting is whatever you'd have in your grid. It's basically just also included on this pop up so that if you wanted to come directly here, you wouldn't have to, you know, do things in two different places. Suppress so repeating is going to um, say you have a value that uh, in one of your columns that it's the same thing for every single record you could um, click this and it would show it on the first record and then any time that it would repeat in that column it's just not going to show it um, for any it wouldn't show it a repeating value ever the control break again same one as on the grid uh, the page break that is like what we talked about um, we can see that one in the sort options on the generate window and um, that would start a new page every time this value changed. So every time there would be a new cash account, I'd get a new page of my report. Uh, function, same thing, uh, my sum, average, min, or max. The alignment can come in handy. So if you are building or customizing a report and you notice that maybe two columns like one is to the left and one is to the right and the information is kind of butting right up to itself um, this allows you to change the alignment so um, different fields have 
kind of like a set standard, like, you know, numbers are usually to um, the right. So um, if you needed to center something or, um, you know, change it to a different alignment, that this would I don't usually set this one ahead of time. If I'm um, working on building a report, usually as you're going and kind of testing it, um, if you notice them running into each other, just kind of a handy trick to have. The column title, so this will default to um, the standard title. So it would be, I believe the display name um, on your report, but if you're looking through those column titles, on your report and um, there's something that you want to override or change so like this one says full account code but if I want this to be cash account instead I can enter my own column title um, and that'll also be the label on any control breaks that you have These next, uh, this next group, they're kind of similar. Um, the control footer and the control header only. It allows you to basically um, add information to your control break um, as a header. So um, if I had my control header, let's look at got a lot of reports here. Um, let's look at my budget summary. So. In this example, my control header was the full account code, and um, then my second control header was this object one digit level. If I say I wanted the description of this cash account to be included on this same line, I could make it a control header only, and then it would add it um, right next to um, my original control header information. The control footer is the same exact idea, except for it would put it um, down at the bottom before uh, the totals for that header. The best example of this that you can see in the software is um, the financial detail with July 1 cash balances. How those cash balances are in the header and the footer, that is using the control header only. So if I wanted to do that, I would um, just check the control header and then you make the sort priority the same as whatever control header, uh, whatever control break you want it to be included with. The detail header. So this one, and actually uh, this is definitely an example we can see on our budget summary. If I choose to make something a detail header, this is a detail header. It's just going to move it instead of on that line, it's going to move it up um, above that line as a head, as, as kind of a header, yeah. So that's what a detail header would do. And the last thing on here is, is the width. So um, this is basically how wide is your column? Uh, each of the columns, they are going to default to um, a standard width based on the information that is included in the column. But if you needed to force a column to be wider, so say you say your figures are wrapping or something like that, um, you would be able to enter a different width here. And so it would basically be like your number of characters. I want to say for my like for the totals I usually start with like 15 um, if I'm looking at one of these total fields and it's wrapping um, but again that's one that when you're kind of customizing a report you might have to kind of play with uh, keep in mind too that there is so only so much room on a page so if you make all of the fields a wide like a bigger width it is going to have to take away somewhere so be a little careful with that one All right, and then 
once you um, get your settings here, you'd want to save. I actually, yeah, let's. If I really want this to be 15. But I do want my column title to save, so. Yeah. I'm just going to, I'm just redoing this because I think messing with that with the column, it didn't like that. <laughs> All right. Next, we're going to hop to figures. Uh, I'm sorry, configure, <laughs> figures. <laughs> I'm just blending those words together. Uh, configure filters. Um, but I want to kind of break on this point because we're getting to, you know, a lot of these fields that can be used in different ways and see if anybody has any questions up until this point. How are we doing? Okay. Well, we will keep rolling on then. So the configure filters, um, now we talked about the properties um, basically being, you know, this is what I want to see on my report. These are the columns I want to see. What the uh, filters will allow you to do is narrow down um, the information within those columns, within those categories. So, you know, on this one I said, I want, you know, my cash accounts, and then I want this information for each cash account. But what the filters will do is let me say, well, I only want to see cash accounts that qualify for this. Um, that could be something as simple as I only want to see cash accounts that are in the general fund. So I would be able to type in um, a filter in the general fund, uh, a filter for the fund, rather. Um, but when we get to this page, when we're actually building a report, uh, this looks a little bit more complex than what we saw um, when we're just generating the report. And um, what we're seeing here under the filter values with all of these uh, param options is that these are actually set up to let the user choose when they're running a report. That's what this means um, when you see this. There is an option where you could actually kind of like hard code options into the report. So when that report is run, it's not going to ask. It's not something the user can define. It just will always run with that filter. Um, so for this, uh, I'm going to leave these ones the same, but we're going to add our own filter on here. Um, and this works the same way as when you're bringing the properties and adding them to your report. Um, you're going to find your property, and then you're going to uh, click and drag it over. Um, and actually, I want to show um, a little trick here that I think Dee mentioned on that last uh, roundtable call that we had just talked about with the UAT group. Um, but if you're looking for a, pro a certain property over here, uh, this list can get pretty big and, you know, sometimes there are things within um, different categories here. So um, an easy way to try and find what you're looking for is to let your browser, um, to use one of these little tricks you can use in your browser, which um, on your keyboard, if you do control and then F like Frank, it gives you a little search pop-up. And um, I know that I want a month to date amount, so I'm gonna add month to date received is what I wanna filter on. Uh, I could keep typing here, or I can use these little arrows to kind of find the next one. And uh, that's a pretty easy way to search in this list. Once I find the category, I'm just gonna drag it and drop it over here. And now I kind of have a blank slate for this, um, for this filter. So uh, the first thing I'll choose is the operation. Um, again, probably your best reference is to check this out in the wiki if you're trying to figure out, you know, what these mean or um, which one to use. But I'm just going to kind of talk about some of the common ones here. The first operation is equals. 
so um, if I know the exact value that I want this field to be, I can use the equals operation. And then whatever I type into that filter value, it has to match exactly. Um, just for good measure, I'm going to skip to not equals. So that is exactly the opposite. If I put equals zero, um, I would get everything that matches zero. If I did not equals zero, I'd get everything except for that. Like allows you to um, just have the start of the value. So say I was going to do this with um, like an account code or something like that, and I want it to be just what starts with one, the number one. I So I don't have to put um, necessarily like a wild card when I use it in this filter value. I could just type the first, you know, three characters of something. One of um, is, um, it'll, one of is, is what allows you to use uh, commas. So uh, for this one, if I wanted a list of values, I wanted anything that was zero, one, or two. Here, let's look at what this one would be. So this one, anything that matched zero, one, or two, um, that would let me choose a list. Um, I just want to hit back on like, I don't want to be um, misspeaking here when it comes to the wild cards with the numerical values, you may need to use the wild cards there. Uh, these parameters are written to let you know if you, if you need to use a wild card in there. Um, it may just be characters, um, like alpha characters, where you can get away without um, likes in, at least within the report writer. So. Um, contains is going to let me type in some kind of value and then if any part of this property uh, matches that, it would be included. Between allows you to um, enter two values. So this is if I wanted anything where the received amount was between one um, and 10, I would do the first value comma the last value. And then um, we have greater than, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to. Um, so those ones are pretty self-explanatory. We are gonna use one of these as well um, for our example. Um, and then we also have not one of, which is kind of the opposite of the one of operation. Uh, so let's choose greater than, because what we want is anything that has a received amount that is more than zero. Uh, you know what, let's hop over. I'm just going to go to our documentation page real quick since we have it open in another window here. Um, if I go to report, custom report creator, I do have a section for configure filters here. And um, if you are uh, looking for more information on these operations, we have the um, description and then we also have examples of um, how you would enter these values. And if you're interested in being able to actually write the parameters so that it can be chosen by the user um, when they're running the report, we have uh, screenshots of what uh, examples of what that would look like and what it would look like on the report. So this grid is very helpful if you are um, working on um, customizing a report and you need some of those more complex options. All right, so now we have our filter in there. Let's go to generate report. 
And um, what this last tab is, so now that we get here, this looks pretty familiar because this is what we were looking at when we actually generated from the home page. And um, this kind of allows you to see what your report is going to look like when generating, and you can generate it um, prior to actually saving to make sure that this is, you know, what you actually wanted. Um, you can also change if you want the title. Um, if you want the title on the report to um, appear differently uh, or to appear a certain way, then if you update it here uh, before you save the report, then it would um, save in those parameters as well or save in, in the standard report template. The query option, so we didn't actually change anything here. We added our own at the bottom, but we just hard-coded it into the report, so it's not going to show on this page. And then the sort option is kind of standard here, but we can see um, that our fiscal state receivable, that was our new field that we added. So we can see that in there. Um, but let's generate and see what this looks like. So uh, my title saved in here, that's excellent. Um, I have all of my fields, my fiscal to date receivable, um, my fiscal to date receivable is the one that I added and I added a sum. Um, so I did get a total on that. And it's only showing me um, items where my received amount for the month were greater than zero. Now here's a really important step. Um, once you make your own custom report here, um, or if you customize one, you want to make sure you save it. Uh, so I, I'm going to come up here and give it a name. Um, and uh, once I do that, I click Save Report. You can do this throughout the process. So if you've collected your properties and um, set all kinds of like complex extended properties you can do this give it a name do save as and then continue working on it and continue to save and update it along the way uh, sometimes that's a, a good option if you're making um, complex changes because you know if you move out of the page without saving you could definitely lose your work i've been there <laughs> Um, I could go right back to the report manager from here. Um, there is an option to restore a report. So if you wanted to pull up, you know, a certain report parameters from here to work with, um, you have some options at the top. Um, but let's also switch over to look at the custom report creator just real quick. Um, this is what you start with. So again, selecting your object, this is going to be the most important um the first important step here at least and once i select an object then it's going to uh, load the properties that i have the option to choose and i'm seeing the same grid that we just looked at where i select my properties select my filters and then i could generate the report from there um so again it's just a little bit easier to look at when we when we start with something um, but I just kind of want to give you a view of what would that would look like when you first start, if you are going to go from scratch. All right, so um, what we're going to look at um, real quick is uh, when we were looking to generate those reports, we um, talked about how you could add a filter. Um, we're going to kind of hop over, we're doing the report um, menu here, which we're almost through. We still have the report bundles um, and then the utilities. Uh, since these account filters can be used with the reports, um, we're going to kind of mesh these together for a minute. Um, so under that utilities menu, I just went to the account filters and I can see any filters that um, have already been created or that imported from classic. And I could also create a new account filter. Um, 
where these came from in classic is from your USA security. So if you, uh, if, if districts had users that um, had certain restrictions on the accounts that they could see, then uh, those would automatically come in. Um, yesterday, I know Michelle looked at the users. So there was a spot on the user page where a filter could be added to a user account so that it would restrict them to still only uh, see certain accounts when they're logged into the system. Um, but what's kind of cool that happens with redesign is that, you know, those filters came from the user accounts um, in Classic, but now you have the option to add more filters and use them on reports. So it's kind of got this whole, uh, this whole new layer of functionality. Um, so let's create one of these and see what it looks like, and then I'll show you how you can use it on the report. And since we are uh, sticking with that cafeteria fund today, I'm just going to go ahead and stick with our uh, cafe theme for the name. Um, just note this is case sensitive. So if I give that a capital C, I have to remember that for when I'm going to use it. And um, to add a line for an account here, I just clicked this plus icon at the bottom. I could add, you know, multiple lines here if I had, um, you know, different uh, filters that I wanted to add. So say, you know, I wanted um, two different funds or um, something like that. But uh, it is important what order you put these in. So the same way that uh, the USA security or like mapping would work in classic where uh, the system will look at the first line first and on down the list. Uh, so you want to be cautious, um, you know, when you're adding multiple filters of the order that you're adding them in. Um, and if I wanted to remove a line, I could just uh, delete it out of there because uh, we're just going to do kind of one for this example to keep it simple. The transaction indicators here, um, this actually matches the um, indicators from classic where zero zero is cash account. So that would give them um, access to anything in the appropriation, expenditure, cash account, of course, and revenue. Um, so if I do zero zero and then my fund, um, this wouldn't restrict them specifically to like expenditure or revenue accounts. Um, if I did want to make this more specific and only give them access to budget accounts in this fund, it would be um, O2 that I would use. And then if I only wanted somebody to access revenue accounts, it would be O3. So again, that was zero, zero for cash, zero, two for budget, and zero, three for revenue but we're going to stick with cash on this one. And I can tab through here, enter in my fund. Um, if I did want to restrict to like a specific um, function or like a function that starts with, you know, this, I could enter in a couple digits and I can use wild cards in here. Um, I can also use ranges in here. So if I wanted this to be from um object code 400 to um 699 then i would just do um the same thing like we talked about on tuesday with the ranges where it's two dots between them so there's two periods i'm just taking these out because i want my filter to actually work and I want to make sure I have accounts that match when we use this. <laughs> um, I could do, uh, yeah, I have the rest of our account code here. We could do special cost center subject. Um, it does have the receipt code box kind of um, wedged in here because uh, you would be able to use this for receipt codes or expenditures um, depending on what you need. The access level at the end here. So um, these are um, truncated as far as um, what each means, but if you hover over, it'll let you know uh, what that checkbox is going to do. So um, 
if I'm making this for a report filter, I really don't need a whole lot of access. Um, so a lot of these apply to uh, filters when you're actually going to put them on a user. Um, the first one is create. So create would allow um, access if somebody has access to um, through their via their roles to be able to create accounts, and then they have a, this filter on it. Um, if you give them create access, they could make new accounts that match these filter parameters. R is read only. Um, this is what we need for reports, so I'm going to go ahead and check that. Uh, that basically allows them to see the information related to this account. U is update, so um, they can't add new accounts, but they could edit them. And then D is delete. P is going to be pre-encumbrance, which means they can um, post requisitions to it. And then E is encumbrance, so that means they can post purchase orders to it. Now, of course, those work uh, with their roles. So, you know, if you had a filter assigned on the user, they'd also have to have a role that would give them access to do those certain things as well. So it would kind of work together. Um, but as far as just like whatever access they have, um, you know, if they're restricted to an account, um, they would need to have um, you know certain settings there depending on what they're doing and then once um, I'm all set and um, if I wanted to add you know additional filters here or whatnot when I'm good to go I can just save this up And these do take a minute. We actually had some good conversation on our prioritization meeting yesterday about um, looking at the performance of saving these account filters. So um, that is something that will hopefully um, be able to fit into the roadmap to um, get that speed up a little bit. Uh, but once it's saved, we're good to go here. I'm going to close out of this one. And then um, when I come back to my home menu, let me go to my budget summary. And I'm just going to clear out back to my default options. Um, so on my query options, we saw this filter name um, field here before. And what I can do is type in the name of the filter that I created. Again, I do have to make sure I put my capital C in there and uh, generate that report. And I can see that did filter it down just to my um, fund for 006. That option, so we did a really simple one, but um, that definitely comes in handy uh, when your districts are um, coming over to redesign. If there are um, more complex, you know, parameters that they would use with um, their reports, like I know some of them would, you know, have, uh, they, they'd heavily use the ranges or um, their wild cards in there. And some of the standard filters that you would see on this budget summary um, let me get back in here so we can look at this um, you know as far as like the funds so this includes the wild card um, so I could get you know maybe everything that uh, started with five um, when you're looking at your grant account um, so I could get you know everything that has a fund that started with this but I can't um from the basic report you know necessarily have like a list of those or um, a range of those so there are definitely ways that we can um, help you help your district you know write custom reports if they have um, certain things that they're trying to um, input in there but a lot of times the easiest way around that is to just 
have them create an account filter and use that with the report. Um, Cause also you only have to create that account filter once and then they can use it on, um, you know, all of the reports that, you know, use the account. Any questions about those filters? All right, well, we are at 10.15, so um, let's go ahead and take a break, and then we'll get rolling again at 10.30. All right, we hit 10.30, so um, let's go ahead and we'll get started back up here, um, get through um, a couple more report items, and then um, we'll hit the rest of that um, utilities menu. Um, so let's go, we've been working with our budget summary, so I'm just gonna go ahead and click to generate this again. Um, the next thing that I wanna talk about is scheduling reports. Um, when we get to the report bundles, we'll talk about scheduling those. Um, and that's more of a recent feature. Um, but with the individual reports, uh, you can also schedule um, a specific report to send to an email address or um, like FTP address if you have that. Um, so what we're looking at here is this last icon on the very bottom, this uh, clock says schedule as a background or a periodic job. Um, if this is something that you are wanting to do, uh, again, there is a wiki page for this, so we'll click that in a minute, but actually let's pull up our walkthrough um, and then we can kind of take a look at some of those steps. So I'm going to the appendix and um, this is gonna be under the report procedures. And um, this is, scheduling a report to run via a cron job. So my first step here, find that clock item when I'm in the generate report window. And when I click that, I get this little pop-up and I have some parameters that I need to enter in order to schedule this job um, or schedule this report basically to run. Um, the first thing is the job name. So this uh, does default to whatever your name of the report is or the title on that report. If you are going to be scheduling reports this way, if you're scheduling multiple like jobs to have reports send, um, each of those job names does need to be unique. So uh, for the sake of this one, I'm just gonna go ahead and pop my initials on here because I know that that's unique to anything else I have scheduled. Um, the next thing to enter is the cron expression. And this is why I kind of wanted to open up our wiki page first because um, this cron expression um, is basically a little formula that is able to tell the system what time interval you want to have this sent on. Um, the easiest way to figure out what this little formula should be is to use one of these websites that has a free online cron expression generator. Um, so let's open one of these. And um, what I could do is I could use this uh, little generator to designate, you know, I want this to be sent every two hours or every couple of days um, or something specific here. But if I scroll down, I have examples and this kind of gives me some standard expressions that I could use. So if I wanted this report to send every Monday at noon, then I could just come in here and copy this expression and paste it right into my report. So what this tells me is I'm going to have a budget summary report um, with whatever options I've chosen send every Monday at noon and the send output to is where I want that to be sent. Now you do have to have your, uh, your um, instance configured so that it has 
uh, the appropriate information to be able to send emails. There's an email configuration. Um, so as long as that's set up and it has um, the proper like server information to send it through, then you're, um, you'll be able to send emails directly from the software. <clears throat> so I'm gonna choose to send this output um, to my email. And all I'd have to do at this point is save it up. Oh. I'm going to try typing it in because sometimes it the spacing is pretty important on those. Okay. Well, I guess it doesn't like that one. I don't know why this always happens. Um, Let's try one of these simple ones. Let's try every hour. Oh wait, that's every even hour. Let's see. There we go. Okay. So um once so you may have to uh yeah, be careful there with some of those expressions. I'm kind of surprised um, that that popped up. But either way, so once you get one in there working, um, we saved it. Now it's scheduled. Um, so I can close out of this. And um, where I can see that that has been scheduled is going to be in the utilities under the job scheduler. I can see um, that this was a user scheduled job. Here's my name. Here's my report name that I put in. And then um, I can see that it's pending. And if I click on this, I do get some more details. Um, this would show you if it's pending or if it's sent. Uh, once it starts sending, it would give you like the last run and then the next run, uh, the next time it's going to run as a date. So sometimes that can be helpful. Um, and then if you wanted to stop this one, like now I just scheduled it pretty often. So if I wanted to um, have that not send anymore, I could come in here and delete my job so that it doesn't keep sending every hour or half hour or whatever I ended up choosing there. Now the report bundles, so you also have the option to schedule those via uh, a cron job as well. Um, and you have a couple other options um, for scheduling these too. So uh, let's switch gears and actually look at making kind of a simple report bundle. And then we'll talk about um, the ways that you can schedule that since um, they're kind of similar. Um, so I just went into my report menu, report bundles, and then we created. Um, of new one. I'm mean, just could give the report num uh, bundle any name that I wanted there, um, a description if I want, or any tag. And then um, what I would do to add reports to the bundle is use this drop down list here, and uh, let's let's pick this cash summary that we made earlier with the month to date. Um, if I want to add this, I um, select it from the list here. Now, we looked at how there were different save and recalls that you could have. Um, if you have any save and recalls, it would kind of show uh, different uh, report options in this list, but uh, this one was just standard. So if I click the plus, it'll move it down to the reports that are currently in my bundle. If I want to add another report, um, I can come up here and I can start typing too. So if I want a budget report, I can type in budget and it'll narrow this down for me. Um, let's look at the budget summary and see, I, I can see now, oh, I had a save and recall for, oh, cafe fund. That's the, the first one that we ran today. Um, so let's add that to our list. And I could continue coming through here and, you know, selecting different reports and adding them to the list of reports that are in my bundle at the bottom. Um, when I have these in here too, I have a little edit option. And um, so I don't have to have like a specific save and recall ahead of time. If I wanted to go filter down one of these reports, 
I could use that edit and then come in here and, um, you know, enter in specific parameters if I wanted to. You know, say I wanted this to be just the 018 fund. Um, I could generate it to see what it looks like or click continue and then that'll save it, you know, in my list. Um, and that also allows me to add multiple versions. So, you know, now my cash summary down here is filtered just to the 018. So if I wanted to add another one for all funds, um, I could do that. Now, this is kind of a quick example. Um, we've talked about the report bundles on some of our previous uh, Fridays with Fiscal. So, um, if you would like more information on um, like creating the bundles or even like this monthly bundle and how uh, that that works, um, we had a report bundles uh, training specific to the monthly bundle in December. And then um, I think we touched on it as well in that um, September reports training. Um, but this is the basics here. So once we get it added, um, we have some different options on our grid. Uh, the first one is to be able to schedule it. So we'll hop in there in a minute. Um, but some of these other ones, view would just give us a view of what we just looked at, what we just set up. If I did want to edit uh, what reports are in here um, for my own custom bundle, I could go add more reports if I wanted to. I could delete this bundle um, using the delete button. Or for any of these, um, anybody that has admin or um, system manager access has the ability to disable the report bundles so that they don't send to, they're not like sending automatically. Um, the monthly one automatically runs when the month closes, when the posting period is closed. So, um, you know, if you have a situation where you need to reopen or a district needs to reopen a posting period um, for something and you do not want that to rerun, you can just uncheck to disable that. Uh, so let's get this bundle scheduled. And when we come to schedule this, we have three different options. So the first one is a cron job, um, the cron expression. So uh, these out or these um, different fields here are the same thing that we just saw when scheduling an individual report. Um, and the same rules apply. The job name does have to be unique. The cron expression, so you can get this from um, a, a generator, a cron generator website. And then sending output, you know, that would be um, like your email address or FTP. And the last one here, you want to make sure that you don't forget about this, is the archive type. And um, what that basically lets you choose is if it's going to be um, a single a single notification with multiple attachments or multiple notifications with a single attachment. So if you think about this, if you're sending this via email, and I have um, you know, three reports included, do I want to get one email with all three reports or do I want three individual emails? Um, for the second one here, event, uh, similar um, options at the bottom, but we, instead of the cron, now we have an event and um, this drop down gives you all the different options. Uh, we're working on getting some more um, detailed documentation um, as far as what each one uh, corresponds to, but we do have them listed in um, the report bundles page as far as um, what these events can be. Uh, the one that you want to use if you are um, doing something similar to like the month close when the uh, like when the monthly cd runs is the posting period close completed event
And then the last option on here is the immediate option. So if I'm trying to um, just run all of these um, reports on demand, if I want it to run right now and email to me, I would just choose immediate, enter in my send output file. I'd still have to make sure I have that archive type checked and then I'd go ahead and save that and it's gonna send it to me right now. When you are using this option where um, you say you're, you are sending this to an email or scheduling these to send to an email, um, whether it's with a single report or with the report bundle, um, this isn't requiring a user to log in. It is using, it is sending through email. So you wanna be careful about what reports you're including. Um, certainly not recommended for anything that would have sensitive info on it. So if you have, you know, a vendor um, report that has their ID numbers on it or anything with ACH info, um, I would, you know, suggest not using this uh, method to send those type of reports. Okay, so um, that is that that wraps up for the report portion. Um, I'm going to hop to the utilities menu and go through um, some of our other pages there. Um, I know you guys have been pretty quiet, but I still want to um, give you a chance to ask any questions if you have them about reports. Um, I know that can be a lot. So any anybody have questions? All right, that's fair. Well, if you think of anything later on, feel free to send us a ticket. Um, all right, so last portion that I have here is just kind of looking through these other utilities pages. Um, we hit the account filters. Um, next up is the account change. So this mimics the, um, there's like an account change program that uh, they had in Classic. And what this is used for is to uh, take all transactions related to one account and change them to a different account. Uh, this might be used if they are um, like combining accounts, you know, they're trying to condense down to a specific, um, specific code uh, or less specific code maybe. You know, maybe they had jobs and now they just want their job codes to be zero. Um, this can be used if they, you know, change an OPU, possibly, if a building changes um, or something like that, then um, it's an easy way to just get all those transactions switched. The first difference, um, the big difference between classic and redesign, so redesign is only going to change transactions in the fiscal year, in the current fiscal year. Um, and that's okay, it's just, it's just different. Um, and then um, what will happen to the old account is the old account will still uh, exist on file because there'll be um, like older year transactions associated with it, but it will be inactivated during this process. To do this, um, they would create the account change, um, but they first may want to uh, make sure that the account that they're changing it to, if that doesn't already exist, they may need to create that. Um, instead of having to go back to that core accounts page, we do have these buttons right here where they could add a new account right from this screen just so that they have this all in one place. Um, this is basically your same options that we looked at on Tuesday with um, adding an account code um, through there. So if they did need to enter a new code um, that they want to change it to, they would use this, but that's an optional step. Um, if both accounts already exist in the system, they can skip right over that and then just come to create. And once you're up here, um, you have the fiscal year, that's gonna default to current. 
Um, and you would basically just pick, uh, this is, you know, the old account, and this is the account that I want to change it to. Um, one uh, other big note here is that these have to be in the same fund in Special Cost Center. So if those are not in the same fund Special Cost Center, you'll get a warning or an error, rather. So this one, these accounts pretty similar. I'm just changing my OPU on this one. Um, I could save this up and then it's going to add it to my grid. And I should probably be careful because um, both of these now are the same account codes, so that could get messy. Um, we're not actually gonna apply both of these, um, but say I did have two different account code changes um, I could, or you know, multiple, if I had a list of them, I could check this and then apply all. Um, or, you know, I could um, just select one, apply that. And if there's one of these that I don't need in here, um, say, you know, that was the incorrect one, I can delete that and then just have uh, the account, the correct account change. And then when I click apply, it's basically going to start a job. Um, I'm in a test instance, so I'm not sure that this will complete. Um, I forgot to check my settings ahead of time, but it will at least initialize it. And really, uh, there's not too much that we need to see here. Um, what you're really going to look for is this status. It says new. Um, once it gets started here, this will eventually change to show that it's processing. And then when it's completed. It's pretty straightforward. We've also discussed um, some updates to the report so that there will um, be a report that can show that information um, before and after the change. Um, right now, we do have a standard account change report um, that has the basic information on it as well. Um, so if they're making um, certain account changes, they can uh, come run this and then um, it would just run for um, any of the kind of current changes that have happened. The next one on here is the automatic reconciliation. So we saw on the disbursement page on Tuesday where there was an option to pull in a file to automatically reconcile your disbursements, your checks. Um, and I mentioned at that point that there is a page where you would set up what that format is. Um, so this is where you would do so. And um, this is where you can tell it that um, when I have that file, you would just, you would say if it's a CSV or a regular like six length text file that the bank has given the district to import. And then um, these import fields, this um, really is hard to give an example of uh, specifically, but um, what you would do is you would take the format that the bank's given them and then use this to tell redesign you know, what to expect from that format. Um, so this is saying, you know, the first thing, the first thing in that CSV is an amount. Um, maybe the next thing is the bank account number. Um, after that, I would expect to see, you know, the, the month and then the day and then the year. Um, they might, like the bank might be able to provide them something that shows here's what the layout is, and then they could take that and match um, the layout in here and match the settings to what they set up in here, um, or they may need to look at the file. But this page will make a lot more sense if this is something that you do run into, you have a district doing this, um, and certainly we can help you through um, if you need to set that up. Change password is super straightforward. This is basically just for my own user account that I'm logged in here. Um, so when you are in, if you have, you want to change this password, 
Um, for us, you know, we can access the user page, so this isn't really necessary, but it's something that um, users that don't have um, as high a level of access, if they needed to reset their own password when they're logged in, they could. The file archive, so in my test land, I wish I had one in here, but um, I don't have any any showing um, at this point, but this is where your monthly reports would go um, when that monthly bundle runs. Um, it's going to send over uh, the reports to list in the grid, and it would show like um, you know December 29, uh, 2020. And it's going to show the month, the fiscal year, um, and a description. So um, once that's in here, you'd be able to click on a row and then view the associated reports. There's also a tab up at the top for fiscal year reports. So once we get to fiscal year, then those will be separated out. The file import is used to pull in your classic uh, monthly CD files. So um, in order to grab those, what you would do is transfer out um, that group of monthly CD reports from Classic. Um, you want to grab it at like the highest level from the district, and it would have those, um, you know, sub pages for that are organized with the year, uh, the fiscal year, the month, um, etc. And then you would take those files zip it into a zip file and you could upload it through here and import and then um, that would allow the classic monthly cd uh, reports to pull into that file archive grid that we just looked at so they'd have those along with um, the new monthly cd um, reports that they're generating from the bundle Next up, we have mass load. Uh, this one, again, very simple page. Uh, this is available to use for your cash account, your expenditure account, and your revenue account pages. Um, there are required headers. So I mentioned earlier, if you're pulling a report, um, you can use that Excel field name to get you the headers that uh, may be needed uh, for importing. Um, but uh, I believe there are also specs out in the documentation uh, so take a look at that if this is um, something that you are looking to do. Um, this works the same way as like the USA load in Classic. Uh, basically, you would make a spreadsheet and then um, any information that you wanted to update on existing accounts or um, potentially like creating new accounts would have to be contained within that spreadsheet to add to the system or update in the system. Um, let's see, uh, I'm going to come back to the proration utility, we'll, we'll end on that one, um, but just to knock out a couple of these other um, miscellaneous pages is uh, purchase order refresh. Uh, this is not something that um, I think you'll use a whole lot. We really just uh, found a reason to use it. Um, what If you're canceling a $0 PO, uh, we just added some notes on our post import procedure page that um, do actually refer you to use this page. Um, but what this does is just uh, there are some cases uh, that are um, don't pop up very often where a purchase order um, the status of invoiceable or not um, may not update for one reason or another. Uh, this is generally something you'd probably contact. You'd probably have a ticket into us and we'd say, you know, hey, go to this, enter the purchase order number, and refresh the state. Uh, this is not something that your districts have access to. It is just an administrative um, page, and it really doesn't change anything. It just tries to, um, just basically looks to the transactions and tries to make sure that uh, the transaction you enter here is, is up to date.
show profile again this is just um, definitely a miscellaneous page this is really just showing me here's my username here's the district and then here are the roles that I have And last but not least is this proration utility. Um, so this one we talked about at calendar year end. Um, I think I showed an example in our redesign calendar year end meeting um, in regards to workers comp. Um, at this point, you know, that is probably the best example of what this proration utility can um, come in handy for. But I think that there are probably other uses as well um, that districts may be able to find um, how this works is I'm going to uh, select a time period. So if I wanted a uh, calendar to date, or maybe let's do like fiscal year to date totals, um, I would need to add an account filter if I wanted this to be narrowed down only for specific accounts. Um, if I do no filter, it'll run for everything, which might take some time. So we're going to make a filter. Um, and then, or actually, let's use our cafe filter. Um, so we put an account filter in there, and then we would do um, And then the file name, so that is the file name that I want to give to this file that I'm making. And I click Create. And what this is going to do is it's going to find any of the accounts that match my filter and it's going to pull a fiscal year to date uh, total for each of those accounts so that um, I can show it in this column here. Uh, from there, it's going to figure the total of everything that I have in this group of accounts and it's going to figure out what percentage went to each account. So if I have an amount that I wanted to spread over these accounts and I wanted to, um, you know, instead of just charging an, an even number to each one of them, I wanted to charge it um, to in the right, um, the right percentage to each account. So say I know that I need to charge um, $1,000 to my food service accounts, um, then what I would do is enter it in this um, pro rate amount in column B. And it'll take my $1,000 and it says, all right, so um, here's how much the total was for this. This is the percentage uh, to designate to this account. And then it'll figure out what that amount should be to charge to each of these accounts. So when I get down to the bottom here, uh, this was the total um, to all, this is the total charges to all of these accounts. And then um, here's my $1,000 that was spread out. This could come in handy. Uh, you know, sometimes districts are trying to figure out how to um, distribute certain, like, benefit charges. Um, you know, that's where kind of like workers' comp, they're just trying to estimate, you know, how it's spread out. Um, but yeah, there may be other uses for this as well. Um, in this case, you know, I already know my total amount. So with workers comp, um, at the end of the year, at the end of the calendar year, they usually know their uh, total amount, but they may not know it partway through the year. So if they need to get a little bit more complex in trying to uh, do some kind of calculation, what I would do instead is click this download. And they can open this right to Excel. Um, and then once they get it in Excel, you have a bit more freedom as far as using, um, you know, any other more complex formulas. If they want to, you know, take the total from here and do any sort of percentage, uh, like if they know their workers comp percent, then um, they can they kind of have more uh, ability to to do some different things once it's in Excel. Alrighty, so um, that makes it through our utilities menu. We have some um, additional miscellaneous things that Michelle is going to cover. Um, so I'm gonna get ready to um, hand it over to her here, but does anybody else have any questions on um, what we've covered so far?
Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Can everyone hear right, me well, okay? Yep, I can hear you, Michelle. Okay. All right. Just testing quick. All right. Cool. So I'm going to let you, I'm going to just um, stop sharing so that you can right. um, take it over to finish this up. Thank you. Okay, can everyone see my screen okay? Yes, I can. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so what I'm going to be covering, this won't take very long, so we're definitely going to finish early here today, which you guys are probably very thankful for after a, a full week of USAS. Um, what I'm gonna talk about today is I'm going to go over um, the EMIS, or EMIS, EIS extract and just talk about that a little bit. And then um, just a review then of where all of our documentation, our webinars, our YouTube channel, the status of the migration, just kind of um, just touch base on all of that once again, and then we'll wrap things up. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is the EIS extract. Um, with inventory, uh, we have, you know, obviously they're still going to be doing their inventory in classic EIS, but they can pull their information from redesign and place those items on the pending file in EIS. Um, yesterday when we talked about um, the configurations and the modules and things like that, um, there are things that need to be set up ahead of time. And what I'm going to do is we have an actual link um, to uh, steps that we have set out there underneath our useful procedures that talk about how to create that inventory extract and importing it into classic EIS. And so before you actually run that inventory extract report, and yesterday when we were talking about the extracts, I had said that most of the extract options are available under the extract menu, but we do have some underneath the report manager, and this would be one of them. Um, the inventory extract report is actually in the report manager. But before you run that, um, you do have to go into system into modules and install the EIS Classic integration module and then you need to go into configuration and edit the classic integration configuration to enter a pending threshold. So I'm just gonna go into the configuration just so we can talk about that here briefly. And so what you're gonna see is you're gonna see a pending threshold amount and also an automatic uh, checkbox. So basically, if they want to emulate what their pending threshold setup was in Classic, and that was in USA Con, there were a couple options in there that allowed them to set um, whether they want 500 or 600 object codes to be included or just 600. That's what this automatic does. Um, will automatically update the pending file for 600s by default if, or if checked. If unchecked, um, the user will be prompted for 500 and 600 object codes. Um, so they just wanna make sure that they have that same setting in here that they did in Classic. Also the pending threshold, um, whatever pending threshold amount they had. So that's different from their capitalization threshold. The cap threshold is still in EIS main in that screen. So that's nowhere to be found in redesign here. It's just the pending threshold amount isn't set in here. Um, so whatever their pending threshold amount was, maybe it was $500, $1,000, um, maybe their capitalization threshold is actually $5,000. Um, so they just want to make sure that they have the right amount in here. Let's say we're going to change it to 1000 And they just want to save that then. And what happens is while they are um, processing their invoices for those PO line items that are $600 or 600 object code or higher. Um, 
I'm sorry, an A600 object code and they have a pending threshold amount. So that item amount is $1,000 or more. That item then is going to get flagged um, so that it can get extracted out of redesign and then input it into classic. So let me go back to these steps. So after they get this part set up, what they're going to do then is they're going to go in and run this pending extract report. And so I'm going to go ahead and take you to that report. And I know while this report's coming up, um, there have been some changes that um, are going to take place for period H. And it sounds like um, capital asset reporting is not going to be required um, for fiscal year 20 period H reporting. So while this, this is coming up, I'm gonna take you to where that information is located. I'm going into ODE's website into the EMIS changes document out there. And these are the scheduled fiscal year 20 changes. And in there, they have scheduled for the May 21st release. Um, they are stating that they're going to be removing the capital asset reporting. So capital assets are no longer needed and will no longer be collected. So this also means that their supplemental collection, supplemental collection is no longer needed and that the financial appeal window can, will likely be moved up closer to the financial collection. So they just posted this not even a month ago. Um, and they said to please reference note 2179, which is just a couple um, down from there. And here they're saying the purpose of the financial supplemental collection is for districts to report capital assets. And they had a couple little extra things, uh, non-capital stuff in that supplemental period as well. So now as they're saying that capital assets are no longer being reported to the department, this collection is no longer, the supplemental collection is no longer necessary. So those non-capital asset items that were part of that supplemental collection are going to be included in the regular period H collection that's always um, due by August 31st. Um, so it sounds like we're not going to have to use EIS EMS to generate sequential file or use the FFE to get our capitalized asset information uploaded in the data collector and reported to period H. It looks like that's all done. Um, but um, district should still be tracking their inventory um, for insurance purposes. Um, I'm not sure with audits, you know, they're still going to be looking at that stuff. So they still need to keep that up. Uh, and going. So they still want to make sure that they're doing these extracts um, and posting this stuff into EMIS. Or, I'm sorry, into EIS. I don't know why I keep saying EMIS. Um, I was working on EMIS a little bit earlier today, so that must have been it. Um, but so here is this inventory pending extract report. Um, so basically, um, it's in CSV format already because that's the format it needs to be in in order to, for it to get uploaded into Classic. And then there's uh, query options here and a sense date. So they're going to put in a sense date and it's going to go out there then. And based on those um, invoice purchase orders, it's going to pull everything since that specific date. Um, and then it just generates the report and creates a CSV file. So that CSV file obviously is saved somewhere on their computer. So what they need to do is use some type of file transfer program um, to, and that's step four here, to transfer that file over into Classic. And so then in Classic, pull up my Classic stuff here. They have that file transferred over. They're going to go into pull this over here. They're going to go into this EIS IMPR. So it's basically this is a program that was specifically created to handle the extract files coming from redesign. 
Um, so it's an EIS EMPR program. And basically it's very simple. All they have to do is once they file transfer that file over, and let's say I called nine test.csv, um, then it's going to execute and whatever is sitting in the CSV file is going to be added to the EIS pending file. So it's not going to replace whatever's in the pending file. So if I go into <clears throat> my pending file here. So it's not going to replace and wipe out what's currently in here. Let's say I had five items sitting in here right now and I have 10 items from the extract. It's going to add it to that. So in total, I'll have 15 items sitting on my pending file. Um, and that's really it with that. So basically, once you know you ran this program, you can go in and either view it in the pending file like I just did, or you can go into and run the 501 report to get a list of all your current pending items. Um, so not a whole lot to it, but again, I know that it's not required for period H reporting anymore, but they still need to keep on top of their inventory for other reasons. Okay, any questions about the uh, inventory extract? Okay. Well, the only thing I'm going to cover now is just um, review of all of our documentation and just a couple other uh, <clears throat> housekeeping things for you guys. Um, I'm just going to go back to our wiki page here, our main one. And, um, you know, a lot of the information that, you know, Amanda and I have covered uh, within the last few days has basically been part of the USSR documentation. So a big chunk of it everything's in there. We have, um, we have this differences from classic USAS. We put that out there a long time ago. Um, and that's basically was telling everybody what the main differences were. Um, and I can't really tell you when the last time that this document's been updated, um, but it was more or less for everybody just to get used to what was in classic, you know, that's, it's now changed in uh, redesign or what do we have in redesign that we didn't have in classic. So it is just kind of an overview. So for those of you that are just brand spanking new to this, it might be a good thing to read and catch up on and see where the differences are. Um, this navigation um, area we have here is just containing um, specific things uh, found in USSR, how to navigate. Um, shortcuts, uh, query, the redesign icons and buttons, things like that. Um, so lots of good stuff there um, just um, for people to review. And also you might find that some of this will be very important when you're training. I know we've had a couple ITC say they use this all the time during their initial training just to have them um, navigate um, and just feel a bit more comfortable with that. So if I go to like the query option here, well, that one I need to redo. <laughs> what to pick? I'm gonna go to this one. Um, so this talks about all of the redesign icons and what they all mean. So for them just to get comfortable with those, we have that listed in here. I think the most popular option in here is the grid um, because in here we talk about how to customize the grids, um, all the filtering options that are available. So those are listed down here. So this might be a good area to go over with um, your districts um, so they know how to do these shortcuts when they're doing filtering in the filter row there. Um, the highlight view, how that's a really good tool. They just click on it and this little highlight view um, pops over on the right hand side so they can quick see information without having to go in and actually open up that transaction. Um, how to create reports from the grid and the more option. So, and advanced query. Um, they might find themselves using that um, quite a bit. If there's something that isn't provided, a property that isn't provided underneath more, um, chances are if they use the advanced query, it's provided underneath these properties here and they can go in and create basically a filter and even save that filter and pull it up whenever they need to run it. So those are just good tips to show them um, 
when you're doing training and even after they start up, you know, once they get comfortable um, to, you know, maybe like we were talking yesterday about doing touch base webinars and stuff with them. And these kind of things are good to show them after they've gotten a little comfortable with the system just to reinforce like, hey, you can do this. That way they are more comfortable with the system and, you know, they'll go out there and try these at that time. So that's our navigation manual, basically. And then obviously the one that we've really touched upon um, is our actual USSR manual. Um, so you click onto this. It's obviously going to give us, if I go and look at all these, all of the different things that we've been talking about within the last um, few days. And so one thing that we've tried to hit hard is the appendix and um, the breakdown of what we have here, our checklists. So those are, you know, fiscal year end, calendar year end checklists. So, you know, we're, we're you know, always updating those before we meet during those time periods and um, in case we need to make any updates or add something or remove something on it. Um, so those are always going to be found there. Um, our general procedures are just um, procedures, just processing procedures. Um, how you go out and create accounts, modify them, um, payable processing. So it's just kind of a step-by-step -step, um, for districts to use. And then uh, the next one is our migration procedures. So these are where the pre and post um, procedures are at. So when you're doing your test imports, you're wanting to take a look at this stuff, you know, when you're doing those test imports one to two months before they actually go live, just to make sure, you know, on the pre data extract, you know, these are the things that we should be looking at. So these are kind of some of those cleanup things that can be done ahead of time. And then um, the post obviously are things that can be done after um, import. And so that means that these are some of the things when you're looking to test balance these districts and make sure you know, you're doing this definitely ahead of time. You're not to be doing balancing when they're actually going live. You should be doing this way ahead of schedule. Um, and so this information, especially the data cleanup part and balancing, these are the things that you really need to pay attention to during your test imports. Um, the application setup is really, you know, things that you definitely need to look at. Make sure that the import logs is the first thing you need to do on that test import is go in and make sure and, and take a look at those import logs and they are located under the neat um, system monitor, um, the admin log tab, we looked at that yesterday, but it was blank for some reason. I don't know why the log file was not on there, um, but that's where you would be going to take a look at that information. Um, we have, um, we have uh, prior uh, Friday webinar recordings that talk about um, the admin uh, log file and looking at the import log. Um, so I believe it was last year. So you'll have to look back at the Friday webinars to see which one that is. But it was one we talked about the post and pre-import steps. And we also talked about the um, log file. Uh, we do have a link also for common import errors and warnings. So when you are looking through the log file, um, you know, if you see something that looks like an error warning, we are trying to document those, and this is the link where we've documented them. Um, also, reviewing the application health. So, you know, when you're doing that test import, make sure that that application health looks okay, and that's the first thing that you're going to see out here. If I go back to my link here, it's this guy right here. So it's just reporting, um, is the application health okay? I mean, is, or, or are you seeing some type of error messages. So you want to make sure that la that looks good as well. And then um, review the activity ledger grid. If you see a warning that states that the data may be incomplete, then there is a problem. Something happened with the import and that activity ledger did not get completed successfully. Um, so that's something that needs to be looked into. Um, the rest of this area here, go to, you know, underneath modules and configuration. And these aren't just setup things. 
So, um, so these are things that you probably um, may not be doing on during the test importing. Um, these are things that you're going to be addressing um, when you do the actual import. But it's not a bad idea just to go in and get familiar with these things um, and make sure that you know things are 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 you're going you're able to get into them and you're able to enter things in there so you shouldn't really have any issues with those um, but the data cleanup i can't stress enough how important it is to look at this and go through these and make any necessary um, corrections that you need to do in classic um, during a test import so we just um, updated this uh, not too long ago and we kind of separated out the data cleanup versus the balancing portion, which is down here. Um, and like I had said yesterday, we are going to do a webinar on this and talk about these in more detail um, that first Friday in May. Um, so we will get the um, schedule updated. But we're going to go through these again, because like I said, it's been a while since we've done this. Um, and so we're going to talk about the data cleanup, um, go over these carryover encumbrances and what reports and stuff you can run to help you find the carryover encumbrance issues. Um, and then also, so that's, you know, all of this is what we're going to cover then. And also um, covering balancing issues. So, you know, these are things that you should be checking out during your test imports to make sure that these reports are balancing with the reports in Classic. Um, so yes, yeah, so this is where all of this is at. Um, just to kind of go back up here to this carryover encumbrance, like I said, these are some of the things that you'll be looking at, um, but we also have, and we bolded it as a link um, regarding carryover encumbrances that goes into all the different possible differences. So when you're running that carryover um, encumbrance report um, and you know, you're know you seeing 10 different account codes with um, amounts on those, you need to come here and take a look at these, um, what possible differences that could be causing that. Um, if you have a negative amount with that account on there, then you want to first look here and say what um, possible uh, differences would encounter a negative account. Is it maybe because an account was deleted or maybe the invoice is defaulted to a future year date or possibly um, they went in and actually deleted an invoice in the new year. Um, so there's just lots of different things. So you need to look at that amount first to see if it's positive or negative. And then from there, um, we've got all of these different things that could be causing that. Um, so we basically give you, you know, a, basically a table of the possible differences, whether it's positive or negative, what to look at. So should we be looking at an audits report to find the reason why? Um, should we be looking at the activity ledger um, and looking at the invoice statuses and dates to find this? And then if you click on each of these links, it's going to explain what's happening, how to locate the problem, and then the solution. So this is a really good reference um, to look at when you're trying to um, handle those carryover, reckon, those carryover encumbrance issues. So like I said, we will go into detail on this more in May, but for those of you that are, you know, going through these test imports now, this is a really important page to look at, um, and this will help steer you in the right direction. Um, I'll go back here. So here's where I was talking about earlier underneath our migration procedures where our common import errors and warnings are at. So this does list um, some of them that could be causing um, issues. So when you're looking through that import log and you're seeing some of this stuff, you know, you can reference this page and it will explain those import errors or warnings in more detail. Okay. I'm going to go back. 
my appendix here. Um, our report procedures are just um, processing guides for you. Um, how to create um, a custom report, how to create the financial detail spreadsheet with the running fund balances. So yes, you know that the fund debt that we have net in Classic is not the financial detail report in the redesign. Everyone understands that, um, but if you have a district that wants to have those running balances in a spreadsheet format, there's a way to do that. And so this gives you those step-by-step -step instructions. Um, so scheduling a report to run via cron job. So those are some of the things that Amanda just showed you guys. So that's all available underneath this report procedures. Useful procedures. Um, so the inventory extract one I just went over is on here. So these are just useful procedures that are out there um, just to give you step by step. Like when we talked about the budgeting scenario steps yesterday. Um, this information is out there and step by step how to do that. So if you need a step by step uh, on some of these uh, procedures, they're available out here. And then the last one is the one that we have we pulled together not too long ago, um, and we keep adding to this. But these are frequently asked questions. You know, we just you know getting tickets from you guys, you know, we have a lot of them where we see a lot of duplicate type of questions and we thought, you know, it's a good idea to put something out there um, that has these all document, documented in the same spot. So it's easy for um, the end user and the ITCs to use. So we've labeled these out here and they're just basically frequently asked questions. Can an account code be deleted? How can budget adjustments be entered? Things like that. So you can break this down. And if it's something related to purchase orders, you can click on the purchase order link. It will take you to this area. And um, so, like I said, we keep adding as tickets come in um, and as we think of things, um, of you know, things that we thought might be beneficial for you guys. And we'll put those out here in our FAQ page. OK. Um, any questions? I get my chat up here. Any questions at all uh, regarding um, the documentation that we have out there? Okay. Well, I'm going to go ahead and move on here and just talk about a couple other things. Um, if I go back to um, I'm going to go back to the top of our wiki here. Just a couple other things. So we really, you know, talked about the USSR documentation. We do have newsletters. Um, so obviously you guys have been receiving those. And so these are great points of reference um, for your um, districts. And so we are um, starting to get the one around for April. Um, but like our March one, um, you know, if you guys receive these from us, um, I believe most of the ITCs are on our distribution list, um, please forward these on to your um, districts. We do have, we do try to send it out to the OEC and TREJ distribution list, but I'm just not sure how many um, treasures or districts are on that. Um, so when you get these from us, please forward these on to your districts as well so they can get this information. We have some really good links in here. And one of them I wanted to um, talk about is down here is our migration status. We have this on every newsletter and it's just an easy way for districts and you guys to access the information. We are constantly updating the redesign status um, based on our touch base calls that we have every other week. Uh, we update it to report how many are uh, went live. Um, and also right here um, is a listing of the current districts and their status. So this is something that Scott Waltower has um, created. And it goes out there and um, shows everybody that's currently on Wave 5 and everybody um, below that as well. And so you can go in here and resort this by the waves. Um, by default, it's sorted alphabetically by district, by the ITC, um, by the status. So um, 
if a district wants to go in and take a look at this, they can. It's always provided in that uh, newsletter. And it's also on, take you to where that's at. We also have it available underneath our state software redesign area here. There is a production implementation area and the implement, implementation details is going to um, discuss this as well underneath implementation status. It's just a little bit easier to get it through the newsletter, um, but I also wanted to point this out as well because um, it does go through and just give you an update on what's going on, especially um, where the projects um, are at, like ARF and EIS, you know, we're working on that. Um, so ARF definitely, you know, we've got a focus group that we are in contact with every month. Um, and these are uh, district people using ARF right now in Classic. They're giving us feedback. And so we're showing them the changes that we've made um, in the new AR module um, and just getting feedback from them. So we're in the middle of, you know, getting that ready to go. And our schedule of completion is this summer. So we're hoping to have all of that available here at the end of the summer for um, districts to use as an actual module in um, uh, USASR. So in here, I'm going to go back um, to this. What you're basically going to see is you're going to turn on that module and it's going to show in the menu here. And it's going to say accounts receivable, I believe. And then it'll have all the different options underneath there. So it'll look very similar to these other transaction uh, and other menu options here. So that'll be pretty cool. I've been in there um, helping with the uh, testing and stuff like that. So pretty exciting stuff. So looking forward to that. And also um, EIS is scheduled for the following year. So the summer of 2021. So um, so they're going to be you know, working on that after they get the accounts receivable module out there. And um, we also have a YouTube channel out there. Um, so we do have a lot of our videos and recordings are available out here. We have playlists for USASR and um, USPSR, so they're right listed right here. So when we try to create a video, we make sure we try to mark the playlist. Um, so, um, so they're available here in case you wanna go out and take a look at these. Um, so all of that's, um, so that's probably the biggest part right there of the SSDT channel that might be beneficial. We do have some classic stuff in there as well. Um, but the ones that people are referencing mostly are the redesign videos. So those are out there as well. And if I go back to our website, I think the only other thing is, you know, your um, information for you guys, other than um, the user documentation, let me see what else be beneficial for you guys. We do have, obviously, um, we have the SSDT meetings and trainings page is where you guys sign up. So that's all under the, underneath this ITC training and registration. So that's where you guys are going. Um, like I said, we're going to have the USAS um, videos uh, recordings available here probably by maybe tomorrow um, afternoon or early next week. And we'll have the recording links here um, so that you know anyone that's missed a, a, a section or if you just re want to review a specific area, you can go to those. Um, our Friday webinars um, from prior years are listed here. You click on that. And so some of these might be very beneficial to look at still. Um, so all of this information is sitting out here from last year um, and it's good to uh, look at that stuff. Um, that balancing carryover reconciliation report um, we were talking about um, and the import um, areas underneath there, that's from that August. So you can go to our YouTube uh, video and take a look at that if you wanna get more information. But like I said, we're going to be covering that again here in May. 
So lots of good information for you guys um, to review out here. Um, we will have, you know, our year-end meetings coming up here shortly. And so um, with classic and redesign, and so we broke those down by calendar and fiscal. So that information is out there. And like I showed you guys yesterday too, the training uh, PowerPoint, I just updated that um, not too long ago. And so that's available for you guys to pull down and tweak um, for your training for your districts if you wanna use sections of that. Okay, any other questions? Okay, well, um, we will be sending out an evaluation um, probably either today or tomorrow, and it's going to have CEUs attached to it as well. Um, on the evaluation, we really would like for you guys to fill that out. And on the evaluation, there is a section for you guys to enter in any future Friday with fiscal webinar topics that you would like to see covered. So um, based off of the uh, training that we've been doing the last couple of days, if there are certain things that you would like to have more training on, please include those in your evaluation. Um, that'll give us, you know, a list of things. I noticed that you guys did that for payroll last week. So that's going to give us some good topics to cover and create here uh, for future Friday webinars. So, so please uh, fill out your evaluation. And if you guys have any questions regarding the training, you know, um, specific things, create a ticket. We can most certainly help you out with that. Any other questions? Okay. Well, we appreciate you guys taking the time the last three days to um, go over the USSR material with us. I hope you guys all have a great weekend. Take care of yourselves out there and uh, we'll be talking to you soon. Thanks everyone.